All right, we're recording. We're sharing. All right, thanks for joining everybody. This is our this is our fourth student webinar that Physio has hosted. It's our third one on the knee, and it'll be our last one on the knee um, before we move on to a new joint. Um, and for those that have uh, made it the last couple, thank you guys. And those that's the first one here, thanks for joining us on the first one. Um, we do have a recording of the last one that actually went through and successfully made it to one piece. Um, so we do have the knee one for patellofemoral. The first two for shoulder and the away. Um, we were still trialing and airing and uh, the video or this, the recording didn't necessarily turn out. So I apologize for that. For those that I told you we had it, um, there was nothing on it. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So today, um, for those of you that is the your first time, um, I'll do a quick introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Marshall Lemoyne. I'm a physical therapist. I graduated in 08. Um, so I've been at this maybe 12 years now. I did a orthopedic residency um, with Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. And then I went on and performed uh, two fellowships, one in movement science, movement analysis, and another one in spine, with the emphasis on spine. I currently still work at Kaiser Permanente in the residency and fellowship, as well as treating patients as a clinical specialist. And then I also teach in an entry-level DPT program, um, assisting in the orthopedic um, chairs or the orthopedic session. Um, yeah. So today we will be talking about knee stability and movement coordination impairment. So mostly ligament sprains. Um, and we'll, again, we'll be using the app to kind of walk ourselves through the clinical reasoning, through the differential, and kind of go through that. Um, however, I'm going to switch screens for a second. Stop sharing. Some of the questions um, that came across over the I made a note. Some of the questions that came over the week, over the week um, were based on not necessarily just orthopedic stuff, but they were both trying to figure out how to use physio in general. Um, I know I did this the very first week, uh, about a month ago, but I know it's kind of different every week for the people that come in. So um, I figured it'd be instead of answering each person individually, I would kind of go through uh, as a group. So I spend the first five to seven minutes just going over as a group. Um, Anybody new coming in, if you guys don't mind, just putting a mute in yourself when you come in just that way, we can kind of, everybody can hear. Um, so this is just the website, so physiou.com, right? Are you guys able to see that, Cameron? Am I sharing that properly? Yes, you can. Perfect, okay. So um, this is kind of where you would go and you would sign in to the app, but also in this position, like it's a nice place to go to what we call knowledge, right? If there's any professors out there, there's a professional one that gives you links, but in the knowledge one, we have, it's set up into different types of, it's organized into different types of um, social media and evidence-based things. So you have all your anatomy, your mentoring minutes, sports health, right? So if we go to mentoring minutes, right? It's a bunch of three to seven minute videos um, on all the most current evidence where I take three or four articles. Um, we, were, we were doing one a week. Now that we have a nice big, uh, database of them, we're kind of starting to reuse a couple, but if I go to knee, because that's what we'll go to today, right? Knee away, meniscus tears, IT band, patellofemoral, um, ACL. Um, it has all these different um, different things. And so if we click on ACL, because that's one of the things we'll be covering today, right? It's just a quick video and, talk, and it talks about the article where it came from, um, some of the treatments, another article that I used, um, and it's kind of built for social media but you have all of your references and all of the big important stuff I pulled out written in there, which you won't see on it. Right, but you'll find it on YouTube. Oh, turn that down. Good. So this one's all about single limb hopping, right? So it talks about quality, talks about all the evidence. So it's just a nice way to get a, you know, a daily dose of evidence in, um, in a social media platform. So that would be our mentoring minutes. Um, we have a sports one, which is more focused just on sports. So a lot of like Olympic lifting and running, um, lunges, trunk stability. Um, so you kind of have, so, and that's written by Dr. John Hartman, Dr. Jess Mina. Um, so you have, again, you have different things, but it's a little bit more focused towards sports. Okay. The, uh, the teaching table, 
that's more, that's not evidence-based as much as that's a clinical reasoning-based platform where we're trying to say what, everything that is taught in the classroom, um, how do we kind of make it a little bit more feasible to go into the clinic? And so the topics are more like um, completing this objective, the irritable patient, objective findings, um, when too many tests is too many, right? So it's kind of different, um, different topics based on more some things that aren't necessarily like evidence-based, but more clinical-based. And, and what, we, what I wish I knew as a student going into the clinic and what it's hosted by two of our students at the university that they kind of, what are some of the questions and concerns they have going into the clinic or what were some of the, um, some of the difficulties they had when they were in their clinic in their first couple of rotations. So that would be the teaching table, right? Um, and so again, there's a couple different ones from that. So now if we go to, if we go to the app, get rid of these, good. So here now we're in the app, right? For the last four weeks, we've really lived in this clinical pattern recognition, which is all your orthopedic ones, right? Some of the questions I've received were about either cardiopulmonology or how to use a neuro exam. Um, for our acute care, lines and tubes, assistive devices, a modalities one that's just coming out, and then for wrist and hand splinting, right? And so if I click on cardiopulm, right? We try to organize them very similar to the orthopedic ones where you have like it's the same kind of platform where you click on a diagnosis. There's not necessarily a body chart like there would be in the ortho one, but you still you have diagnosis. Right? And so let's, let's say we click on um, cardiac, cardiac vascular dysfunction. Right? It's built in the same rationale of clinical findings, outcomes. And it gives you a video of what that person would look like, what some of the things they would say, and then your overview. So just like in the orthopedic, when you have an overview of what are some of the risk factors, outcome measures. So what are some of the forms they may fill out? Yeah. What are some of the functional you... tests they may do? Right. Subjective exam. Yeah, what's up? Right. In your subjective interview, what are those key questions that you want to ask them or you would find from the chart? Right. So it's kind of organized in a way, um, just like it is in the orthopedic one, except it's for cardio palm. Then you have your physical exam, so your key findings. A lot of findings when you're in inpatient, you find them on the chart, right? Some of your vital signs, and that's not stuff we're taking because they're hooked up to machines. It's there for us all the time. But some of the tests we are gonna take, right? So maybe you're gonna do range of motion, if you're, depending on where you're at in the hospital, which hospital are you, you may be taking heart sounds, oscillations. So that's how the, um, the cardio, cardiac one is done, so cardiopulm. And again, it, we've just pulled out the six primary dysfunctions that you would see in cardiac rehab. But if you wanted to do just a list of what are all of them, let's say you're just practicing for your cardiac, cardiopulm rehab test, like you have all of the key tests that are just here with the videos from them. All right. So that would be cardiopulm. If we do neuro, again, it's, it's based on what are the primary impairments that you'd see in neuro. So whether it's motor control, sensation, tone, reflexes, let's say we click on balance, right? You have all your different balance tests, right? So too many to remember for me. So it's nice to have a reference here. And even within each one of them, right? So if we click on, let's say, um, sit -sib, right? Within each one of them, you have a couple of different tests within there. So eyes open on your foam surface, you have your different types of them, eyes closed, your Berg test, you have all your different items, right? And then within each one, it kind of tells you what normal is, how to score it, right? So it's a great reference um, to for all of your neuro tests based on which impairment you want to go down, right? So click back to neuro, right? And then once you get out of the impairments, you kind of have diagnosis specific. So whether it's a stroke, spinal cord, vestibular, um, the nice things we can add, we're adding to these as we go on, as we um, find more diagnoses that we're able to film, we can just add to it because all of the testing is done on normal, healthy people for the most part, right? If we click on tone, all, it's all the same therapist and the same patient, which is normal. So it's nice to actually see someone with true tone or true um, spasticity that matches. Right. So that's kind of a quick overview of some of the other apps, neuro and Cardio palm, right? So, but for today, right? Well, actually, does anybody have any? Does anybody have any specific questions on those two um, that they kind of want to throw out there?
Dr. Lemoyne, do you have the poll um, at the bottom? Let's see, webinar polling, yes I do. Yep. I think, I think all you'll have to do is just drop the poll down and then they can answer that question that we had for them. Okay, cool, I'm gonna launch a poll guys. Thanks Cameron. Does it show up on my screen? Am I sharing it as well? Yeah, we're yes, good. It shows up we're good. Yeah. And then you'll get the results once they start coming in. They should pop up on your screen. I'll just minimize that. Cool. Okay. And, and then we can just save that for later. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. So, all right. So if we go on knee, oops, I clicked one too many. All right. And, all right clinical pattern recognition, all right? So, so they think about the first week, we did more of like a medial-sided knee pain um, with our primary diagnosis being knee OA. Last week, we did anterior knee pain with our diagnosis being patellofemoral and our differential being patellar tendon, right? So today, if we click more of like a lateral, lateral knee slash leg pain, right? What do you guys, so go ahead and type in that chat box. What do you guys think would be some of your key um, diagnoses if someone walks in with that as their body as their um, pain pattern so again we're thinking lateral knee pain maybe local or lateral knee pain maybe going down the leg a little bit IT band LCL Coronial nerve. Good. And, and then more IT band, LCL, peroneal nerve issues. You guys had to put those in priority. Which one do you think you see most often in the clinic? IT band, LCL, peroneal nerve. Overall, we have IT band. Yep, agreed. All right, so yeah, IT band is the most common, right? Based on that body part, and you guys kind of nailed it, right? You have common peroneal nerve or fibular nerve right, based on it, um, LCL, and then IT band. IT band is the most common um, as well that I would see, right? If, if someone comes in with IT band, what do you think is their primary complaint? Like, when would they tell you it bothers them? Kelsey says with increased activity. Okay. There's a, there's a couple of um, studies with IT band syndrome, right? And there's one key, like activity specifically. Yep, okay, guys, you guys are running and biking. Yep, those were kind of the two biggest ones was runners and bikers. Um, so when you say activity, it's like a little bit higher level than normal activity. So not necessarily just walking. They tend to get this IT band. Okay, how about with LCL, right? If we're thinking lateral collateral ligament, right? What would you... What do you think is the um, the primary complaint if someone has an LCL sprain? Trauma. Good. Yeah. Yeah. No one really, no one really damages their LCL or tears their LCL or sprains it um, just by getting out of a chair or walking or overuse. It's not one of those overuse things. Um, that's right. Where would they be hit at most likely? Medial side of the knee, varus force. Yep, you got it, cool, okay. And then the last one, common peroneal nerve, all right? Actually, let's go down, we'll go down ligament sprain, because that's kind of what our goal is today. Um, all right, so if we're thinking ligament sprain, you guys pretty much nailed that most of these are gonna happen in um, some type of mechanism of injury. There's gonna be some type of trauma that you don't just wake up one morning and say, you know what, the lateral side of my knee hurts and it's coming from your LCL or go for a run, right? It's always gonna be related to some type of trauma, right? If someone just tears their LCL all by itself, um, what do you think normally, what does the normal um, care look like for that person? Is LCL something that gets surgically repaired? We have bracing, non-conservative options, non-surgical jared said surgery yeah okay. yeah so most of the time actually all the time i think if it's just an lcl an isolated lcl injury they don't do surgery 
right? Because we have so much bony structures on the lateral side or fibular head um, that can kind of give us support. Now, if someone has like a posterior lateral corner injury where they have, they have worked, they've hit possibly their PCL and their LCL and maybe their lateral meniscus, then yeah, if they're going to go in and do surgery, they're going to go in and fix everything because they're going in anyways. But they don't go in and just open um, someone up and do surgery on an LCL, just an LCL, because you have so many other st stabilizing supports. And most of the time, um, our knee, it needs more support on the medial side or on the lateral side, right? Most of them, our knee dives in, right? So you think about this, this force, so we want more medial support. Rarely do we go into this bow-legged out option where we need the LCL. Right. Okay. So if we go down LCL, right, already we talked about it's being primarily traumatic. What are some of the key tests that would help us rule in that this is uh, LCL? Various stress tests all across the board. Nice. Good job, guys. Is there anything else besides various stress tests that might make you more confident that this is an LCL problem? and not a uh, IT band problem? Palpation. Good, palpation. Good, because potentially, if I'm doing a varus stress test, right, I'm kind of pulling on, I'm stretching those lateral structures, so maybe there is a nerve that's running by there that maybe is getting a little stretched, and maybe there is the IT band that runs on the lateral side, and when you do this varus stress, so pain with just a varus stress by itself, you say, well, there's, the numbers aren't fantastic with that, right? If we go to key findings, right, LCL assessment, right, varus stress test, lateral colligament palpation, right, there's really no articles that support a good sensitivity or specificity for LCL. So you never want to do it just by itself. You always want to try to find something else. So palpation is a good one, right? And why do you think that with these tests, these reliability tests, why do you think they're not the greatest as far as research-wise? Why don't you think there's better evidence out there for LCL tears? Not as common. Awesome. Yeah. There are, there are 4% of ligament tears in the knee in general. So think about ligament tears in themselves come part of the knee. It's a very, very small percentage. Um, and the test itself is really based on what I feel move. So if I'm moving someone into this varus test position, I need to decide, is that three to five millimeters for a grade one? Is that five to 10 for a grade two? Or is that greater than 10 millimeters for a grade three? I mean, I don't know how you, how good you guys are at determining five or seven millimeters of movement when you're checking a ligament, right? So in general, it's, it's a hard test to do because of, there's a lot of subjective complaints. So, or there's a lot of subjective differences going on. So ideally what we say is, you know what, let me compare that to the other side. Is that painful? And does it move more? Not just pain, but does that move more than the other side? And that's hard to do for the LCL because of the fact you have so many bony structures that can help support it. Um, so that's why we do it at zero, right? When you're at zero, you have even more bony structures. So it's hard to do, but then you try to do it at 30 degrees of flexion, right? And the reason we do it at 30 degrees of flexion is because it kind of unlocks the ACL, it unlocks the joint. So that way, really, you're hopefully just testing the collateral size. So if you're doing a valgus stress, it's the MCL, a varus stress, the LCL. All right, good. So we have those two, right, as our two primary diagnostic tests. It doesn't necessarily tell us how to treat it, just helps us diagnose it, right? Let's if I go back one. Right. So also part of your knee exam, remember, no matter what the diagnosis is, we're still movement specialists since we want to gather range. We want to watch people move to see what can we correct besides just finding this diagnosis. Right. So differential. Right. Obviously, if it's not coming from the knee, you should always have in the back of your mind. You know what? I did a knee screen. I did a squat. I did knee range, flexion, extension, overpressure. There's nothing. So let me check. Lumbar, that should always be in the back of your mind with lower extremity issues. Let me check lumbar. With upper extremity issues, shoulder, elbow, you're thinking back of your mind, neck. Maybe not your first choice to go to, but if what you thought was, if you, your first choice doesn't necessarily pan out, that should always be in the back of your mind. Okay? So the other structures on the lateral knee, you guys already nailed them, right? You said IT band, you said peroneal nerve. 
how would you guys how would you guys rule in a peroneal nerve issue? So we're thinking it's radiating pain. What would be your test? Straight leg raise. Good job, Gabriel. Sensation. So the nice thing about nerve issues is we kind of pick them up subjectively often when they talk about numbness, tingling, body chart. So subjective gives us a good idea. Like, you know, it doesn't seem like a local structure as much as a neurogenic structure that moves. Um, good. So with your straight leg raise, is there a certain bias that you might put on that if we're thinking peroneal nerve? Inversion, plantar flexion. Good, okay. And I think someone threw out their tunnels as well. Is there a specific place you would tunnel at? Like, is there a common entrapment site for that peroneal nerve? Joanna says fibular head. Nice work, Joanna. How about a second one? So that's the most common one. Is there a second place? And be prepared, I'm gonna ask you what the third place is. <laughs> we have at the ankle? Anywhere specific at the ankle? Right. We don't necessarily want to nail the entire ankle. Think about where the nerve runs. Posterior lateral malleolus. Okay, so not necessarily right on the malleolus itself, because that's the bone per se, but just anterior to that, right? There's a retinaculum, right? So it runs underneath this sheath that we can palpate, right? Um, yep, but it's not necessarily the posterior part. You think if we're plantar flexing, then that means it must run anterior to the joint, because that's how you put it on tension. Versus if we dorsiflex, it runs posterior. So we're thinking just anterior to the medial malle to the lateral malleolus, sorry, um, just anterior over the retinaculum. And the third one, right, the other common one, is in between the lateral gastroc and the peroneal, like kind of where those two muscles come together to make that lateral compartment, right? Anytime you have this fibrous tissue and the nerve has to pierce through that fibrous tissue, it's a possibility or an opportunity to have some nerve irritation. So we think about it, why would that nerve be irritated in the first place, right? Why would someone have a peroneal nerve issue? Inflammation. Okay. Yeah. If a nerve becomes inflamed, it becomes very painful, right? But why would a nerve become inflamed? If I take it a step further. Biomechanically incorrect. Okay. So start to take these answers one step further. Those are awesome answers. Inflammation, biomechanical. Let's think about what what would cause it to be inflamed. And then second thing is the mechanics. Of what would be a common uh, mechanic, mechanical error or issue, I guess, that would lead to that? Sanjay says tight footwear, possibly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we have tight footwear. Um, definitely can kind of compress on that lateral ankle. And then anytime you have an ischemic compression, you get inflammation as a result, right? And inflammation makes the nerve much more sensitive. So then when the nerve is supposed to move, right, it's moving like an open cut with salt in it, right? Very sensitive, so it's going to hurt. So yeah, um, entrapment from a shoe. Another common one is sitting with your legs crossed. So think like a figure four. It puts the nerve on stretch at the knee, but then also when you're sitting, it crosses over um, and you compress it on the, on the, pretty much on your own thigh, right? Um, I actually had a girl, um, maybe like a year ago, who gave herself a palsy, a peroneal nerve palsy, because she sat with her legs crossed um, and she was sitting, you know how like people sit with their foot underneath their chair and they sit on it? Like you have one leg under your butt and you're sitting on your butt or you're sitting on your foot kind of thing. She sat like that for three hours, just studying. And then all of a sudden her leg went from being numb and or went from being tingling to then numb that she didn't even know there was an issue. She kind of just ignored it and eventually it went away. There's no longer a sensation because the nerve pretty much died. Um, and so when she got up to stand, she just pretty much collapsed and it took her six months, six months for her to regain um, like the sensation, um, the motor, like all that stuff. So it's, and so it's just compression for three hours. There. So, yeah, so a lot of it is these unwanted compressions that we're sometimes not even aware we're doing. Um, how about if we're thinking, so that's mostly at the ankle. How about if we're thinking a little bit higher, um, maybe at like the, the calf muscle, peroneal muscle area, what would be a reason why it might get irritated there? Go 
Good. So I see tight muscles, Courtney. Yeah. If someone has um, limited inversion motion, limited plantar flexion, they had limited motion because of maybe the gastroc or maybe the peroneals, those tight muscles, right? If there's less mobility there, the nerve runs through them. It can definitely cause some irritation. Um, we have repetitive stress. Okay. Uh, which direction would we have that repetitive stress? Eversion? Eversion. Um, Planner fudge and eversion? Think of what would stretch the nerve. We've talked about compressing. Good job. So inversion. inversion over lengthen. Yeah. So if we're still thinking at the foot, ankle sprains, right? Plantar flexion, inversion, ankle sprains. A lot of times we think, oh, that pulls on the ligament. But what runs right next to that ligament? The nerve. So we're going to have at the ankle, at the knee, the repetitive stress may be that they have a little bit of a varus thrust. So every time they walk, their knee kind of pushes laterally, which then gives a quick stretch to that right peroneal nerve, right? Or maybe they have a lot of rotation at their tibia when they walk. If they have a lot of rotation at their tibia, what's getting repetitively moved is that fibular head, which means the nerve's being irritated. So we think about majority of the time, the nerve is going to be irritated by being overstretched. So some type of lengthening issue or by compression. Right? Nerves don't get irritated with shortening. Right, They like to be in slack. So you think about the compression is going to be sitting wrong, tight shoes, something like that for a long period of time. The, the quick stretching is going to be ankle sprains, a lot of varus thrusts, or some rotations. Nice thing is you guys nailed it. How do we rule that in? Straight leg raise with a bias, palpation on our common, on our common impairments or our common entrapment sites. Right? So you guys nailed that. Good. Okay. So we're going to go a little bit, I'm going to take us into a little bit different app now to finish up the ligament stuff. So instead of doing clinical pattern recognition, I'm going to go to our special test app, which is more of just all of the tests for the whole knee, but really they're organized in a way where if I go to instability, right, and we're going to live now in kind of this um, ligament world. So if I said we're going to rule in ACL, right, what would be your top tests to rule in ACL? Lockman's. Nice. Lockman's one. What else? Anterior drawer. Good. Anterior drawer. Lockman's are good. Is there another one that's kind of used that the research says is really good that clinically maybe isn't the best, but it has good numbers because when it's done, people are a little normally sedated. Lever sign by Shannon. No. Um, that that is a test for ACL. It's not the one I was thinking of, but that is, the, yeah. Pivot. Good job. Pivot. Yeah. All right. So think about that's the one that all these studies that right before they're ready to cut them into cut them open, right? They've already done MRIs. They know it's torn. They're sedated. They can do whatever they want with the guy's knee because there's no guarding. There's no pain. And then they that's a very good test for that. But in the clinic, at least for me, I'm not able to sedate anybody before I do any tests. Um, so it makes it. Harder to be as clean. But yeah, so anterior drawer, Lockman's pivot shift. All right, we click on anterior drawer, right? So if you think of this test, sensitivity, 25, specificity, 96. So what does that mean? What do you guys think? If you see a test that says, you know what? The sensitivity is 25, the specificity is 96. What do we do with that information? Rules in an ACL tear. Okay, okay. So if it's positive, it rules it in. I would look at it the other way. If it's negative, only 25% of them are actually negative if they really had a negative test. So if I get a negative on somebody, this misses that percentage, 75%. So I'd, I, I would choose to be a little bit more careful and say, you know what? 75% of this time, this is going to get missed with an anterior drawer. So if it's negative, I have to scratch my head and say, you know, is this really negative? There's not a very good sensitivity with this. Um, yeah, on the flip side, if it's positive, then we say, okay, I feel pretty confident this is positive. So if we go to the next one, Lockman's, right? right? Specificity 94, so pretty close to the anterior drawer, but then now your sensitivity is 85. So if this one's negative, right? 
then I, I can actually truly say, you know, okay, I have a higher chance that it really is negative. I'm not going to miss it. I'm not having a false positive. Do you guys know why that is? Do you know why at 90 degrees versus 25 to 30 degrees, they both have similar rule ins specificity, but um, one has a much higher sensitivity than the other one. Guarding, slat, quads taking over. Perfect. Good. So the people that said slack and guarding, those are the two high ones, right? When your legs bent to 90 degrees, right, your hamstring is a lot easier to able to resist that force because your foot's resting on the table. Your heel's flat. 90 degrees. So when you're pulling, you have a stable, your muscle can pull your tibia back and hold it, right? Here, often the foot's not hang, touching the floor. Maybe the heel's resting on the table, but your hamstring is really inefficient to help pull it backwards. It doesn't have that torque anymore. So you're able to get more slack on it, right? So less conversations. Good. Nice. Okay. So that would be our ACL. And then the third one was Dr. Moyne, I have a great, I have a great question. Ask um, away. When you're suspecting an ACL tear in the clinic, and let's say uh, you're suspecting an acute ACL tear, wouldn't the knee be too swollen in the clinic to perform a Lachman or a pivot shift or a um, anterior drawer? Not necessarily. Because um, even if it is swollen, you still should be able to get it to 90 degrees, 100 degrees. Maybe you won't get it to 130, um, but you can still bend the knee more. It's more going to be if it's painful. Um, but the nice thing is, often with ACLs, um, they're painful, not even as much initially, right? So you think about how many people we've seen on TV, they tear their ACL and they jog off the field. Um, it's more the, the fear that makes it so painful in that, but they're actually able to do stuff. Um, it's the next week where it is swollen and painful that that may limit it is that it hurts. But there's a lot of people that I won't see them for an eval till like maybe at two weeks out, because at first they go in to see orthopedics, they have testing, and they'll come to the clinic two weeks out of, and they haven't had surgery or anything. They're doing like prehab. Um, and they're able to walk. They're able to squat. They're able to do a lot of stuff. They just don't have the stability to like do a single limb squat or to be able to cut or jump. Or, so um, the swelling seems to kind of improve pretty quickly if they're not fearful to move it. And there's no reason for someone with an ACL tear to not move their knee. Right? If it's completely torn, you're not going to do more damage to it by moving the knee. Right? It's already, it's already torn. Um, especially open chain, you're doing stretching on the table. Now, if you're trying to, if it's like a partial tear and you want to try conservative rehab, then there's a difference, right? You brace it, you don't move it, right? Let's let it scar down more because it's not fully torn, um, which again, we're not good at determining is it a full tear or partial tear, right? That's really going to come to MRIs and imaging to determine that. But yeah, I'd say you can still do those tests because I haven't come across too many people that the swelling limits them from bending to that certain amount of, amount of range. Now, sometimes they're fearful to move it that far because of pain. And at that point, it's like, well, I can't, I can't do the test then. But I start to think of like, well, does this fit the clinical pattern of it, right? Cool. Okay. Good question. All right. So pivot shift, right? This is the one where you add, it's still going to be an anterior force, but now instead of pulling it forward, you're kind of coming from underneath it. And you're pushing it, but you're also adding a valgus force, right? Because the ACL helps control against rotation as well. So you're kind of doing this valgus anterior stress with the knee inflection. Okay, so that would be our ACL. How about if we go back? Now let's do MCL. Right? We did this a couple of weeks ago, so it should be a, an easy one for you. How do you rule in the MCL? I'll just stress test across the board. Okay. Is there a second one you want to throw in there? Apples. Okay. Yeah, so apples is good for collateral ligaments. Okay. And with our valgus stress test, palpation. Good job, Joanna. Yes. We always want to palpate it too because we're not just stretching the ligament on the medial side when we do some of these valgus stress tests. We're stressing maybe it's an adductor, maybe it's a saphenous nerve, right? You have other structures there that are also being pulled on. So palpation is pretty important. Um, what's another key finding for someone that you think has an MCL tear or an MCL strain? What would be another, we'll call it a key finding, but maybe it's not an objective test per se, but it's something that would help me clinically reason be like, yep, I think this is a ligament issue.
mechanism of injury. Nice. Yep. You got it. Good job, Kelsey. All right. So now we're thinking hit from the medial side, if it's trauma, or we're thinking there's some type of loaded twist. So a lot of, so MCLs, just like ACLs can happen um, non-contact, right? Where they're doing a single limb activity or they're cutting, they're twisting, and their leg just kind of rotates their foot's on the ground and rotates laterally. Their femur rotates medially, and then your leg dives into valgus and you load that ligament and it can't handle the load. Yeah. So based on that story, um, that would be, um, based on their story, you would already start to think, yeah, MCL is probably going to pop to my head. Now my job is, let me rule it in. And is there any secondary stuff along with that? Right. Because, um, and if we look at the MCL, the testing with MCL, right. Remember how we said with LCL, there was like no numbers for it because it's very, very minimal versus at least with the MCL, it's way more common. So you still get the sensitivity specificity. Numbers. Now they're not nearly as high as the ACL ones. So that's why we want to add a secondary test like a palpation and the story. Um, the first one is when it's at, uh, they do it at zero, right? So you think about now you're testing the joint integrity when your legs at zero degrees of extension. And then at 30, we try to take it into more just ligament to see that. So again, two options, there are two different angles because the first one is more of everything. The second one is more specific to the MCL. Dr. Lemoyne, we had a good question. Um, when you're performing these tests, uh, for example, like the Lachman, someone might have an ACL tear, or let's say in this case, an MCL tear, how would you describe to the patient what you're doing? Um, they might be kind of apprehensive to move their knee. How would you kind of walk the patient through your objective testing? Good question. Um, because if I'm doing these tests, it means there's probably some type of trauma. So they're probably a little fearful or guarded. So part of it is I'm always going to do the other knee first um, because I want them to feel. But also, clinically, if I'm trying to decide if this is torn, and I made that comment earlier, I can't differentiate between is that four millimeters and six millimeters or eight millimeters. So, you're, so I always do the other side first, and I'm looking for stability, for pain. And so I really don't say much except, hey, I'm just going to try to do a couple tests here. Check out your knee uninvolved right? Same thing. All right, I'm going to do the same thing on this side. All we're looking for is to see how well your knee moves. That's kind of my generic terms. I don't tell them I'm testing for their ACL. I don't tell them I'm testing for the MCL or meniscus because if, it, especially if it's in sports, people know about ACL from their favorite athlete on TV or from other players on their team that have torn a meniscus or ACL. Like they're very common injuries, but it's a long process that goes with it, right? If you've torn your ACL, you pretty much lost that season. That's kind of how people think of it. So I don't tell them I'm testing their ACL. It's, hey, I'm just going to test how your knee moves, right? And then, and at that point, I've already done range, and it may be like, hey, let me see how well you can move it. They do active range. All right, let me see how well your knee moves. And I just move ACL. I'll do a Lachman's or an anterior drawer. I try to keep it very generic. Um, and then if it's positive, right, if it's positive, um, that's when I kind of start to say, all right, how do I describe this to a patient? How old is this patient? Does this patient's parents need to be there before I say anything? Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, great question, Gabriella. We have another question uh, from Joanna. Um, what are your thoughts on um, return to sport using conservative approaches versus surgical interventions? Um, good question. So we will, can we hold that for like five minutes, Joanna? Can we hold that till we get to intervention stuff? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Remind me if I don't bring it up, but that was kind of part of my thing is to talk about copers, not copers and stuff like that. Okay. Perfect. Um, nice. Okay. So we pretty much went through MCL, you guys, LCL, we already did. So last one, last ligament, right? PCL, right? Oops. I showed you guys. What would be the key test to rule on a PCL? Posterior drawer. Good. All right. Is there another one? Maybe two of them. Sag Sag nine. Nine. Good. And there's a newer one that's been added that's considered like to be the most sensitive that we need to film. Um, but we added on there your quad active PCL tests. So we have to get to film that. Um, right, where they're trying to tighten their quad and when they squeeze their quad, it pulls the tibia anterior. Um, so that would be kind of be, and that has a sensitivity specificity, so it has good numbers to it, or has numbers to it, not even good, but kind of like the LCL, there's not as many PCL tears um, that happen, right? 
good. So post your drawer and I'll show you guys posterior sag. Okay. There is this, uh, you might come across it on your boards or if you guys are taking your OCS test, um, there's always this question that pops up um, that if someone has, if someone has a positive anterior drawer, so you're thinking ACL tear, right? So when I grab the tibia and I pull it anterior, it's moving too much. There's always this thought that pops up that you know what you have to make sure that it's not really a PCL tear and it's hanging out too posterior to start with, right? So you think about if the tibia should only move so many millimeters, this is the middle, I should only be able to move it three to five millimeters forward. But if it's torn PCL, it's gonna be hanging out backwards three to five millimeters. So now when I pull it, it's now moving six, whatever, six to 10 millimeters. So we're gonna think positive ACL tear, positive anterior drawer. So that's kind of always this, uh, this thought that you'll see it come across all the tests and in the clinic and it's kind of like stuck with me that if I ever see a positive anterior drawer, it's like, well, let me just make sure that it's not really, a, it's not starting too far posterior. So you can put them up into this posterior sag sign and then does the knee just with gravity hang lower? when really the PCL should stop that motion, right? So that's kind of the background. Okay, so that would be our ligament testing, right? So those shouldn't take very long, right? When we do our diagnostic testing, each one of those has two or three tests that we wanna to do to rule it in, rule it out, right? So how do we treat these people, right? So there's two routes, right? Are we gonna send them into surgery and they become a surgical candidate, a surgical route, or is it conservative care, right? So of those four, which one gets, majority of the time, which one gets surgery? ACL tear. ACL tear, that's right, right. What would be the second most common one to get surgery? MCL tear. Yes, MCL, all right. So now if someone just isolate, now if someone just tears their MCL all by itself, there's no medial meniscus, and there's no ACL, and it's just the MCL, those kind of go 50-50, right? Meaning half the time they're gonna have surgery to fix the MCL, the other half, they don't need it, right? They can start down. Do you know what determines kind of where, who gets what? Support. Okay. So sport, yeah, if they're going back to a cutting sport, maybe you would think they'd be more likely to have the thing. Really, it comes down to the surgeon, right? Because the outcomes don't seem to be any different, right? The outcomes, the amount of time it takes to get back after an MCL tear, and if they do conservative rehab and they do it well enough and they control all their motions, they come back at the end of it, right? They seem to kind of have good outcomes um, or similar outcomes. I won't say good is not necessarily right. They're equal outcomes. So the, it's kind of a flip of a coin, right? So if the surgeon says, hey, you should have your, this surgery, then the patient send that surgery. The surgeon says, you know what, you'll do well without having the surgery, right? Okay, so, um, and then remember we talked earlier about LCL and PCL, they do not have surgeries for those two if it's an isolated injury. If someone just has an LCL tear or just a PCL tear, they don't do surgery because there's enough, there's enough other things that compensate for that lack of stability, right? So if we go to, I'm going to go back to clinical pattern recognition. All right, if I click on knee, all right, we'll do all diagnosis for a second. And I'll go ACL, right? So ACL is the most common one we're going to see in the clinic, right? Majority of the time, it's going to be surgical, right? Like you guys said, but not always, right? I think there was a recent study that was like 66% have surgery, um, meaning that there's quite a few still that are not having surgery, right? Um, and they have, they have checklists. They have a checklist that kind of tells you, right? Are you probably someone who should have surgery? Are you someone who maybe you'll do well with being what they call a coper, right? So a coper is someone who doesn't have surgery and can get back to activities. A coper is not someone who doesn't have, a, doesn't have surgery and doesn't get back to anything. You're not a coper, you're just not active anymore. So there's a lot of people that don't have surgery, but they've also given up on being active. They've kind of accepted that, um, which is okay. But uh, if we want to get them back to where they were and they want to get back to playing a sport or being active, we want to decide are they a coper or not a coper, right? And there are a couple of key checks, right? So what do you guys think those key check marks are that determine if, you know what, this person will do well without having surgery and be able to get back to sports? What do you guys think those, those checklists are or that checklist is? 
age? Unfortunately, age is not one of them, right? It's not one of the big checklists, but I would say if someone is 38, 39, right? Um, maybe the amount of high intensity cutting sports is probably going to be a lot lower anyways. So it may be a factor. It's not one of the key ones that they use. Previous functional level, level of that uh, prior activity, type of sport, yep. no, no giving way, range of motion. Perfect. Okay. So, so far I heard one, one that's definitely on there and that's the no giving way. So if, if you tear your ACL and you're able to right? Walk around. And they, I think it's a three month period within three months. Have you been able to go those three months and not have any giving way, right? If your knee is not given way, then that's a, that's a check. It's a positive check mark. Um, and I think the cutoff is one, no more than one. So if you've had one giving way in three months, you're still okay. If it's given away more than once, so it's given away two times, three times, you are not a good candidate to be a coper, meaning you should probably go have surgery because if it's just giving way with walking, Right. Imagine once you start ramping it up to running and jumping, cutting. Right. So that's so that's one for sure. Anything else that you guys think would make someone a good candidate for copers versus not coper? We have triple hop, BMI. Okay. So I we'll take so triple hop. We'll kind of clean up a little bit. And it's just being able to hop on one leg. Right. So the patient needs to be able to hop on one leg because later down the line for discharge. They have to be able to do these noise hop tests, which is your single, your triple, your crossover. Um, they should be able to do those. So if they can't even hop on one leg, if we start to forethink, like are they, are we even gonna be able to test them for discharge to return to sport? No. So that means if they can't hop on one leg, probably a good candidate for surgery. Or flip it, they're not a good candidate for being a coper. Right. It's a strength. I see. Yep. So they need to be able to produce enough strength, which means they have to have good range of motion to be able to test strength, right? And not really have tons of swelling. So the big four would be, right? Are they able to jump on one leg? Do they have good range and strength? Are they able to get that back within three months? Is there swelling? There's minimal swelling to no swelling and they can jump on one leg. Like those are kind of the big cutoffs to say, if someone can do that in three months, then there's a possibility that they could be a coper. And then there's a whole nother level that says, now you train them and then can you then test them for, for you test them with all these hot tests and star excursion, all these other tests to see how well they do. But first, before you even think about going down that treatment route, it's can they do these things? Range, strength, um, hop on one leg, swelling, and no giving way, right? That would be your big checklist thing. So if someone comes in, it's a subjective and they say, you know, um, I hurt my knee a month ago. Okay. I've seen orthopedics. I have an ACL tear. Um, I'm a little nervous about surgery. I don't know if I want it. I don't know. Should I get it? We're going to ask them. All right. Well, um, how many times has your knee given away? Well, it, it hasn't since surgery. Okay. So possible, right? What are your goals to get back to? Well, I want to be able to, I want to be able to get back to playing soccer. Okay. So we need to be able to see if you can hop on one leg. So then in your objective, right? If he's can't hop on one leg, he's fearful. He, he won't, um, or as soon as he tries to jump, he just lands on the other leg right away. We check his range. He's lacking 20 degrees of extension, right? We say, okay, those are things that tell us you might need surgery, but we can work on those over a month, right? I think they cut off three months. So we saw him at one month. We can work on things for two months to see if he meets that criteria, right? At the three month mark, if he still can't hop on one leg, he still doesn't have normalized range. He still has knee swelling. And we say, you know what, if your goal is really to get back to soccer, studies show, the evidence shows you'd be better off having to. right? So that's kind of how we would take that clinically. Who do you think, what do you think is a big component of that as well? To determine if someone has surgery or not, what's another big component of that that we haven't talked about yet? Think about, okay, so that would be a mentality of the patient, right? So heart, I see the heart patients. Um, yeah, if someone has other comorbidities, the nice thing is majority of time when someone tears their ACL, they're normally younger, right? We start to think of this 15 to like 24 year old range is the most common, 15 to 19 is most common, second, 20 to four. Um, really, it's, it's gonna be the surgeon and the patient, right? 
they are, they're going to go meet with an orthopedic surgeon, right? Orthopedic surgeons, what do they do for a living? They do surgery. So they're pretty much always going to recommend surgery unless the patient says they don't want it or the patient's apprehensive or the patient's very fearful. Um, yeah, so Jolene, great job. Yeah, surgeon's opinion. So it's really the surgeons most often are going to do surgery um, unless the patient voices some type of thing about it, right? Um, or there's something about that patient that the surgeon says, you know what? I don't, I don't think you are a good candidate for this. Um, so whether it be some type of heart issue or medication issue, or um, I think I saw BMI earlier on. Let's say someone has a BMI and they don't do any activity, right? Um, I have this, I think it's 48, 49. I have an older guy who did tear his ACL. He fell down a set of stairs, right? He doesn't do any activities. Um, his kids are grown. Um, he works as an electrician. He's still been able to go to work, um, but he feels like his knee feels unstable and it's hard to get off the floor and his knee hurts, but no surgeon's going to do surgery on him. No one's going to do an ACL on him. If they do an ACL on him at 49, he already has signs of arthritis. They're going to be doing a total knee in five years. So they're pretty much going to be like, hey, you're not going back to running or jumping or any sports. Um, right? It was a fluke accident. Fell in so, so he's someone who they didn't do surgery on and they just sent him to rehab. Um, but we wouldn't consider him a coper because he's not really getting back to any sports, right? We're going to consider him just, hey, we're going to manage him, get him as strong as possible, get him as stable as possible, and then we're going to teach him some good mechanics to let to, to save the rest of his knee from progression. Okay, so yeah, so we think about surgery on surgery. Now, if we go down this, um, and that's with ACL, right? Um, if we do surgery, right, if we're doing surgery on a, someone's ACL, phase one, they come out, phase one, what does that look like? Right. What are some of the, um, what are the range of motion restrictions on someone early on in ACL, post-op ACL? Start to think of like any precautions. Like what do they look like early on? Since that's a very big question, let me ask this. What are the goals of phase one? I said, what are the things that we're trying to check box those first two weeks? Terminal knee extension. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. All right. There's no studies that show that getting knee extension, even hyperextension stresses the ACL, right? I think it's eight degrees of hyperextension is when the ACL becomes taut. So if we're getting, if we're trying to get people half time, we can't even get them to zero, right? We're trying to get them to zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. If their other side has four or five degrees of hyperextension, we want it to match. We want them to have equal extension without being worried about tearing the ACL, right? So that's one. Great job. Whoever wrote that. What's another one? What's another key box I want to check in the early two weeks? Quad control. Good. Yep. 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 Good. So we think about if someone had just had surgery, right? The knee is normally swollen. Right, right. You kind of have this inhibition of the quads anytime you have swelling around the joint. It's the most common one is the knee because it's a very common surgery. But they've done studies where if you inject the hip, you inject the elbow, if you inject the joint with just saline, if you inject it, automatically the muscles around it start to shut off. Right. So it's not just the knee, but it's most common at the knee because we see it more. But yeah, their quad becomes inhi inhibited, in right? Inhibition. Um, so it's not that we need to strengthen it because it's weak. We just need to get it to turn on, right? Um, so early on, we want to make sure because the longer it's off, right? If it's been a week since it's turned on versus two weeks versus a month that it's turned on, it takes that much longer to train it, right? Think of it as a neurological patient. If you have a stroke, right, who's been out one week versus been out a month, right, it's harder sometimes to get things to change, habits to change. So, um, so early on, get the quad to move, get the quad to, or get the quad to turn on, turn on. So lots of quad sets, lots of um, uh, straight leg raises, if they can do it without a lag, right? Depends on the lag, good. So definitely quad. Um, what were some of the other ones? Decrease swelling, minimize atrophy, patellar mobility. Perfect, okay, yeah. So definitely we want to um, make sure that the swelling goes away, right? The number one restriction of flexion is actually swelling. So if we're working on flexion with somebody, flexion with someone, and we keep stretching and we're mobbing, right? Studies show if you ice the knee, you can improve flexion better than, than, than stretching because there's just something there. There's there swelling that is there that makes the joint taut, but it can't flex. So 
um, icing. Yeah. So I tell people, you know, I tell them you should be icing 15 minutes every hour in your first two weeks. It is your part-time job. Now they probably go, don't go and do that, but if they do half of that, at least they're icing every two hours. That's great. Right? A lot nowadays, everybody goes home with these ice machines. It has circulating water a lot of time, or the game readies, um, or they're getting ice. Good. So I'm swelling. Doctor Lemoyne. Yes. I've received some message. Can you just mute Marco, please? Yes, I can. Mute. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Yep. Of course. Thanks. Um, yep. And then there's one other thing, right? So we've heard get the quad going as much as you can. Get extension of the knee, tip feb joint. Make sure the patella is moving. Yeah, that doesn't stress the ACL at all, right? It's things we can do. Um, swelling control, extension. Is there something else in the first two weeks that's important? What are they normally wearing? What are they using when they walk? Assisted advice, knee brace, wound yeah. assessment. Yeah, we want to protect the surgery, right? We do not want to be the reason why they go back to orthopedics with the torn ACL again. They have to redo the surgery, right? So in the first two weeks, all right, this graft that got stuck into the knee joint, they use bone plugs. So we need to let those bones scar down a little bit and get some calcium over them um, to make sure that the graft stays stable. So remember, any type of big anterior slide will tear it, any type of big valgus stress into big rotation, right? Especially in weight bearing, right? So we wanna make sure that their brace is locked in extension the first couple of weeks. Are they able to put weight on it? Yes. Do we want people to put weight on their knee when they're walking in the first two weeks? Yes, right? You, don't, you want to make sure that they feel comfortable putting weight on their foot because that actually helps turn on their quad, helps turn on their calf, helps keep their muscles working. You just want to make sure that brace is locked and it's straight to protect the graft. All right, and then, so yeah, so right off the bat, their weight bearing is tolerated, right? Back in the day, it used to be non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing for the first week. Now coming out of surgery, right? It's like, it's like a total knee. Weight bearing is tolerated day one, but protected. So brace and uh, crutches, right? Or a walker if um, they have other stuff going on. But most time they're crutches. Good. So after those first two weeks, then really everything, um, you can then start to take away the brace if they have good quad control, right? You can start to get rid of the crutches if they have good quad control, meaning they can do a straight leg raise without a lag. Right? So that would be our, so, so now if we switch gears, think about the other ligaments that we've talked about today, um, LCL, MCL, PCL. Um, what is, now let's say they're non-surgical because most of the time they're non-surgical, right? The only one would be the MCL, right? Um, but if we're thinking, um, non-surgical, someone tears it, their LCL, their MCL, and they were treated conservatively non-surgical. What does their first couple of weeks look like? Dr. Lemoyne, after this, I, we have two ACL questions that came up a little earlier that, um, Excuse me. that I'll are they related, are they related to the acute care part, like in the first couple of weeks? Uh, no, one is related to at the end of the um, okay. rehab stage, um, and then there's another one. Okay, we'll hang on to that, and we'll go to that in just a second. Um, Perfect. Is this, okay, remind me. All right. All right. I have them written down. We're good. Okay. So think about early on, early on MCL. How does that differ than maybe early on ACL? Someone has a tear of their LCL, someone has a tear of their MCL. How do you think they're going to come into clinic? So they will come in in a brace. Good. Right. So they'll come in in a brace. A lot of times it's locked at 30 degrees of flexion, right? They want to lock it at where the they don't want it to be in full extension. They don't want it to be in flexion. And really for the first four to six weeks, it just heals, right? So it's weight bearing. Um, they have their crutches. They have a brace. It's locked. They keep the brace locked all the time unless they're doing range of motion exercises, right? So 
23 hours a day, that brace on, they sleep with it. Um, it's really, you are trying to make sure that it just scars down, right? If this ligament tore, it's not gonna magically touch together, but if it'll lay down and it scars to parts of the femur, parts of the tibia, any type of scarring is what you're looking for. Um, and so it really just needs to be immobilized. Think of it like a fracture, right? Um, mobilized. When they come into clinic, we're still gonna make sure, hey, does their quad turn on? Does their quad stand? Um, we wanna make sure we bend their knee. They have the range, they don't lose it, but there's a limit. What do you think the limit is? How much do we bend their knee? What do you think it is? Because with the ACL, there is no limit, right? With the ACL, it's within, I mean, the more we can get early on, the better, right? There's no limitation that says stop at a certain amount, but there is with MCL and LCL, with our collateral ligaments. First four weeks, what do we limit them to? Starts with a nine, ends with a zero. Yeah, good job, 90 degrees, Melissa. 90 degrees, right? We don't wanna take it past that because that stretches the ligament too much. Where we can take them to zero, but we don't wanna go into any hyperextension because that puts a stress on it. Um, so really zero to 90, you wanna make sure they can move that far. But once they leave, brace gets locked on, they go home, they keep it there, let it scar, scar, and then they take it off to do their, their range of motion, right? Um, and lock it back up. So really, that's the difference is that you actually have to be more careful early on with these non-surgical people because you're letting it scar down. You want to restart over the healing versus our post-op. Now, if they had surgery, meaning they had their MCL repaired with their ACL probably, or their LCL repaired with their PCL probably, right? Then you think about it, you're going to still go through those immobilizations. You're still going to keep them immobilized for four to six weeks. You're still going to keep them um, if they were a surgical, it's actually non-weight bearing um, with the LCL, PCL for the first week. And then it's, you add 25% every week. Um, so it's a little different for that. So you think about the one you have to be least careful with early on is ACL. Because the studies show the sooner they get back to things and they get their quad to turn on, that's your primary stabilizer of your knee. Right? Your quadriceps is the primary one and it turns off with ACL surgeries. Right? Um, so. so that's kind of uh, the thought on those. If we go back to ACL now, since that is the most common, right? Um, we've talked a little bit about our physical exam, interventions, most is post-op. Um, so after they get through their two weeks, right? We start to think about, it's really, you're just starting to work on improving their impairments. So if they still lack range, you're working on range. Um, if they don't know how to turn their quad on, you turn their quad on, right? What would be one of the, key things that help us turn someone's quad on in these post-op patients. Yep. Neuromuscular electrical stem. Good, yeah. yeah. Um, there was uh, the orthopedic section, maybe like three, four years ago, um, did a big, did a big uh, conference. It was two days all on like post-op knees. So total knees, micro fractures, uh, ligaments. And they pretty much came out uh, they were very strong. The guy that did all the evidence for it out of Pittsburgh uh, pretty said that you are, uh, you are doing a disservice to your patient and it's considered neglect and you should lose your license if you don't do NMES on a patient who doesn't know how to turn their quad on. So not everybody needs NMES, right? It's the people that don't know how to turn a quad on, right? So I have a guy in the clinic now and he hates it. Like he absolutely hates the NMES because in order to be beneficial, you have to ramp the heck out of that thing, Right. When we test it on each other, we kind of stop when we start to see little contractions. But in the you're supposed to turn it up to full tetany, which is very, very uncomfortable. Right? So I've had to prove to him, we'll get a handheld dynamometer and we'll test his quad strength before. And he tests at like 40 pounds. Right? And his other side's like 160. So I'm like really 40 pounds. I don't know, that's, that's a huge difference. So we'll shock him for 12 to 15 minutes with his NMES. Right? He's working on it. He's working on it. He's working on it. Um, and he's, he's yelling, he's biting his towel. I walk away, let him be in peace, let him go through it. But then afterwards we retest his quad strength and it almost doubles. It's like 78 pounds now. So really after 12 minutes of turning it on, shouldn't it be a little tired? If anything, you should test weaker, right? If you just got done doing exercise in your quad for 12 minutes, it should test a little weaker because you're tired. Unless you weren't even able to turn it on in the first place and now it's going to test stronger. So so every time I have to test it with him because that gives him motivation 
and all of a sudden he feels great and he no he forgets all about the bad part about the enemy and he's like oh man i just doubled my strength this is fantastic unfortunately he comes back next week and now it's 49 right so kind of so he loses it over the week so yeah so nmes e-stim russian stim um those are very good is there any other modality that people are using in the early phases someone wrote in bfr possibly yeah, yeah. so blood flow restriction yep if your clinic has um the proper tools to monitor blood flow and stuff like that um they're pretty expensive um how about something that's not expensive at all doesn't cost anything and we still consider it a modality cryotherapy yeah, good job, right? So we're still thinking about swelling control, right? Anytime we have someone work out, so they're stretching, they're working on mini squats, they're working on straight leg raises, are we causing an impact to the knee? Yeah. So are we actually creating more swelling? Yes, we are. But we kind of need to, right? We need to get the range. We need to get the strength. But just remember, when we work on someone's knee, you're causing an irritation to that knee. So we want to make sure we undo the negative. So we'll get the positive. Make sure you're icing. So icing should be a big part of a big part of their um, rehab. Um, good. Okay. So we think about what we're working on uh, to kind of go back to the blood flow. Um, yes, blood flow is very is very important and still very good to use. A lot of studies are coming out now in their early phases of rehab when you have to protect the joint where you can do you know 10 to 20 pounds on a leg press or you can do straight leg raises and quad sets. Um, there was even a study that came out that just having the blood flow on where it just fills up, kind of stays on there and then for six minutes and just laying there, just that itself actually improves strength because it changes like the hormone and chemical levels, stuff that we won't necessarily get into here. Um, but yeah, there's some good evidence out there for blood flow restriction as well. It's just not a, not a common one click. Go ahead, Chris. In uh, CPM, are you seeing uh, orthopedics prescribe CPM after um, for post-op? No, not, not unless... Uh, there's one person in the last probably maybe 10 ACLs I had that had it and they were lacking, they were lacking range pre-surgery that they couldn't get back. Um, and that was the only person that actually got a CPM and went to their house because post-op ACLs aren't staying overnight in the hospital and right? they're going straight home, um, after a couple hours. Um, they got one, but they were unable to get range pre-surgery. So they hadn't seen full extension in three months. They didn't seen full flexion in three months. So they got it, but normally, normally no. CPR, um, not nowadays. I think 10 years ago, a decade ago, it was pretty common to get um, any knee surgery. It was get the CPM, but yeah. Oh, okay, so um, later on in rehab now, so let's kind of skip through phases two and three, which are all about improving coordination, improving strength. And let's say we start getting into maybe more of the sports stuff, right? Um, in order for someone to run, let's do that first. So in order for someone to run um, from any of these, whether it's MCL, LCL, PCL, ACL, right? All of them have the same, the nice things, they all have the same checklist. What are the key things we're looking for before we say, you know what, it's safe for you to run? What do you guys think? There's evidence that suggests they should be able to do these things. Full range of motion, 90% on a hop test, have good strength. So let's, we're gonna put some numbers to these. So they need to have 90% of range, so they don't have to have full yet. Otherwise there's people that we wouldn't let run till seven, eight, nine months, because they're lacking a little bit of flexion, so a little bit of flexion. So you don't have to have full range, but the goal is 90% of range. It'd be nice to have full extension, but not necessarily don't have to have flexion, that's one. Um, strength wise, let's put a number to strength. Mostly it's quads we're talking about. What, um, what percentage of quad strength do we want them to have compared to the other side? Three plus? Um, we want more than that. Let's think of a percentage. Let's say my left leg is my torn ACL leg I had surgery on. My right leg, I can do 100 pounds with the knee extension machine or with a handheld. Kevin Lower says 90%. 90%. Right. And we also have 85%. Okay. 80% by Levi and Joanna. Okay, keep going lower. You guys like you guys want a lot of these people before you 70%. Run. I like your guys' cautiousness, right? 75%. 70%. So we want 70%. The studies show you want 70% before you start letting people run, right? Um, and think about it, right? We don't expect them to get to 90% until we're like, technically that's when we can discharge them almost at 90, 95. And that's, you know, eight, nine months out. So, um, 
we want them to have 90% range, 70% quad strength, right? Um, they don't need to be full, they don't need 90%, 70%. Um, and there's kind of, so that takes care of the range, it takes care of strength. What else do we need to run? Anything else? What else were some of the answers that people threw out early? Balance. Balance is a part then, of it. And then we had stability earlier on. Okay, so you have to be able to do seven out of 10 good single limb squats, okay? So we, we expect people's knee, if you're standing on one leg, even for, non, even for healthy non-surgical patients, you have them stand on one leg and do a single limb squat, their trunk might lean, their knee might fall in every now and then because of balance. Right, so we don't expect them to be 10 out of 10, but we want them to be able to do a single limb squat, right? Um, seven out of 10 times. So we'll do it 10 times and they get three mulligans, right? Um, and that's kind of what the cutoff is. So let's say they only do two good ones. The other eight where their knee dives in or the trunk goes over, they're not ready to run yet, right? And when we say mini squat, we're only going down like to 60 degrees. You're, like, you're not trying to do a pistol squat by any means. It's just... How far does your knee have to bend when you run, right? So you're just trying to go down to these angles, right? So that would be like my checklist. There's one other one that we're looking at. So we looked at strength, we looked at range, we looked at balance slash stability with function. I probably wouldn't, shouldn't let somebody run if their knee is still what? Painful. Um, depends. I'll let, if someone has a one out of 10 and they run and it doesn't get worse, it's still a one out of 10. I'll let them run. Jared says swelling. Good job, swelling, right? So yeah, any type of inflammatory stuff still going on. Um, and I think the, the one who answered painful, the person, like that's a good answer. Um, I just, there's, there's no real cutoff for it. I think it's more of a personal thing. Um, and part of that's because there's gonna be a lot of ACLs who are gonna still have pain when they do things. And if we didn't let them do anything till they were pain free, it would be a two year rehab process. All right. Um, think that a lot of them are going to develop patellofemoral pain, patellar tendonitis because of their quad. If they had a, a patellar bone to bone graft, it's going to be um, very hard to have them do squats and lunges and do anything without having some discomfort. We just want to make sure as they progress, it doesn't get worse. So if they're doing squats with a two out of 10 pain and I've tried to correct their, their form, it looks great. They're ready for it. Like there's nothing I can make. It looks good and it's a two. As long as after the third set, it's still stayed at two, by all means, it's worth getting you stronger because I think the stronger you get, that pain will get better. So we don't need to be fearful of the pain. Um, now on the flip side, if they're a one and then they run and it's a seven while they're running, okay, let's not have you run. Let's, let's work on things still. So good job. So that would be our checklist for running. Most common, when are people allowed to run? When are we able to test for this checklist? knowing that some protocols are a little bit more expedited than others, but typically when are we able to test for it? Four months. Yep, good job, four months, yep. Some of the really fast ones let people start running at three months, but ideally it's four months um, when we can say, hey, you're ready to start running. Three months is for elliptical, four months for actually running. Good, okay, so now let's jump forward. Hey, Chris, do you remember those two questions from earlier? I'll start out first with um, Joanne had a good question going back um, in the early stages with ACLs. Are we limited to closed chain quad strengthening initially? No, you can do open chain, but most of those open chains should be isometric early. So okay. whether you're doing like a straight leg raise at zero, that's isometric or knee extension or at 30 degrees, you're just kicking out against the band and you're kind of living at 60 or 90 and different angles. Um, you can totally get open chain because that actually that isolates the quads way more than our closed chain. You, someone can squat and use their glutes and their hamstrings. Someone can do a leg press and use their adductors. Like you can compensate, but if you're doing seated, a longer quad isometric, you don't, can't really use anything else to kick your tibia up. Now we don't want these open chain movements, right? In the first couple of weeks, cause that can loosen the graft. Um, but really we can do it down here. We can do an isometric at 90 or at zero, I'm sorry, at zero. So yeah, definitely you can do isometrics. Okay. And then another one, um, and maybe you can uh, contest to this. Uh, 
why is there always pain on the lateral aspect of the knee in the patients who are done with ACL rehab? Is that something common that you've come across? Um, I would, I would say no, not typically. Um, I'd say the most common one would be like anterior, which is like patellar tendon, um, for the, for the, especially for the patellar bone to bone grafts. Um, the lateral, if it is lateral knee pain, um, I don't see too many, um, about that. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer that. And then lastly, um, how often do you see the, the, the trio ACL, MCL, and medial meniscus injuries rather than just a single uh, rupture um, of the ACL? I'd say probably about, let's see, if I just look at the ACLs in my class now, probably 50% have a secondary thing. So not always is it all three. I'd say that's a little bit lower down. Um, but I have a girl now that's uh, – MCL, MCL and ACL. I have another guy who's medial meniscus and ACL. So those kind of would both be kind of have a secondary thing. Um, Mike is straight up ACL, John straight up ACL. It seems heaven was both. So I'd say of the five in my class now, two are straight up ACLs, both guys. Um, and then the other three are all secondary. They're all, and again, whether it's Quincy John, they're all younger, they're all teenagers, these three. Two of them are girls that are just loosey goosey, right? They're pretty flexible, um, and they both tore a meniscus. Um, and then the other kid had a, the car had a MCL and ACL. So I'd say it's probably 50 50. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, those are, those are the questions. And I'd say the biggest thing is when they come in early on, doesn't matter what they have, they're going to get knee extension to zero, right? Because all of them. Now, if it was an MCL, I may not go past zero versus straight up ACL. I am going to get some hyperextension. They're both going to get swelling control. They're both going to get quad activation. Um, now, they're both going to get maybe some flexion stuff, except the MCL and the meniscus, we're going to stop them at 90. Right? We don't. Versus the ACL, do what you can. Right? So really, the only limitation early on on the table is the range, the end range is of motion, zero to 90 for these mis. The second thing would be the weight bearing component. ACL, walk what you can. Use your crutches, keep your brace locked, but put your weight on that foot. Meniscus and MCL, it's very, it's non-weight bearing for the first week, partial weight bearing for the second week, and you kind of progressively put load on because the load, even though the knee's braced, it does put load on the meniscus. So we don't want to get any shearing or wiggle in there with that. Um, it's a good question, but that's, um, yeah. Good. Any other kind of questions about rehab? Yes, I have a. Uh, I received a question. What are your go-to techniques for swelling control? Um, I'd say so early. I mean, icing is the biggest one because they're going to be away from me way more than they are going to be with me. So I want to make sure that they have something they can do themselves in the clinic. I may put their foot up and do some like drainage techniques, um, especially if they're like in there for an hour. They can't do exercises for an hour. Their knee can't handle it, right? So I teach them put an elevation. And we'll do some like effrelage and some like pumping mechanisms going, trying to get the fluid to move more proximal. Um, I'll teach them how to uh, do ankle pumps up in that angle as well, right? When they're watching TV, when they're on a computer, like you should never be hanging in a dependent position when you're hanging out at home, right? So it's just teaching them more like lifestyle things um, for those many hours that they're not in the clinic, right? Um, and then, yeah, so I say icing, which they all tend to do at home, elevation, swing control. Um, they normally have it wrapped anyways the first couple weeks, so it's already kind of compressed. Um, yeah. And then remember, what is in regular life, what keeps us from um, pooling fluid in our legs when we sit? If I'm sitting down right now and I'm walking around, gravity's going down, why don't I have swelling in my ankle? Why don't I have fluid in my knee or ankle? What, what gets it back to the heart or back to the lymph system? Muscle pumps. Yeah, exactly. Right. So um, think about we don't have to go and elevate our legs every day after work, right? Sitting on a chair. So because we're walking around, our, our calf muscles pumping it up, our quads, our hamstrings, everything. So just having them do some of their exercises for quad activation um, is very helpful. Is very helpful to um, improve swelling. There was a study that looked at two groups one group that got 
quad contractions. All they did was quad stuff. The other group that got um, range of motion issue, a range of motion treatment in the first two weeks, the group that got quads had better quad activation after two weeks, makes sense. But they also had better range of motion than the range of motion group. And their theory to why that was is because when you were working on all these quad contractions, you were actually pumping out fluid, which allowed the knee to bend more. So it's like, okay, so um, yeah. So that's a good, good question, whoever asked that one. And those don't stop necessarily after two weeks, right? Those just, but that's their part-time job in the first two weeks. After that, when you do stuff in the clinic and you're exercising, you're doing more, that still should be like an end of like, hey, when you're at home watching TV, don't hang out with your feet underneath you where you're sitting in a chair, like elevate it. Okay, so just to make sure we can finish in the next couple of minutes, if we get to the end stages of rehab now, right? So now we're thinking whether they're a coper and they've gone through everything and are ready for discharge or they're a surgical patient and they're ready for discharge, we want to make sure it's safe for what they would call return to play, right? Um, so we're thinking return to play, whether it's surgical, non-surgical, now it's pretty equal, right? It's pretty equal. And it comes down to a couple of big tests, right? Um, there's a, uh, let's see. There's probably maybe like 14 or 15 uh, cutoff checklists that can that you can find in studies. Um, but if I asked you guys, what are the big ones that you'll come across in all the guidelines that say they use these as the checklist to see if you're ready for return to play for knee surgical or knee traumatic injuries? What are they? Oh, that's good. Which hop test? Triple hop. Triple hop, good. Is there any other ones? Single limb. Single limb. What else? There's four of them. There's four hop tests that are used in a single hop test. Or that are used, yeah, single limb, one leg, jumping. Crossover hop. Mm -hmm. One more, one more. Six meter time top. Yep, good. So those four together, right? They they were created by Dr. Noy. So they're the noise hops test. You have single, triple, triple cross, and then timed, right? And what's the cutoff? What are you looking for when you compare those four on the surgical side to the non-surgical side? What is the cutoff we're looking for? Eighty percent to the uninvolved. Is that the same person that put 90% before you run? <laughs> Go a little bit higher. Go a little bit higher. Gabriella and Gerard said 90. Yeah, exactly. So, so 90 is the minimum, right? Now, if I asked you, right, if you tore your right knee up, you had surgery, to, you had surgery do you think that knee is a better knee than your other side, right? Probably not. It has, it's, it's missing a primary stabilizer. It's missing all of the input. So 90 is kind of the cutoff, but ideally the closer to 100, the better, right? So, but 90% is the cutoff before they allow you to return to practice. Not necessarily full on straight sports, but before you can return to practice. That's one, there's a couple other tests. What are some of the other things before you can return to sports? And remember there is, there's a plethora of them. There's a bunch of them out there. But what are the big ones? Scar excursion test. Good, yep. Scar excursion and the cutoff being four centimeters anterior of a different side to side or 94% compared to the other, all three of them. Good. That would be like your Y test. What's another one? Calf strength. Okay. So strength is a big one, right? Um, calf didn't make the primary, but it's definitely on the list. Like they should be able to do um, the same as they can on one on the other, right? So strength, but strength of another muscle. And say so the reason that is, is because most of people's calves are probably back to normal side to side, probably within the first three or four months. Because when they're walking, they're walking way more with their calf than with their quad. Um, but yes, 
So what would be the muscle that gets shut off early on that we spend tons of time rehabbing to try to get stronger? Quad. Yep, quad, right? So we wanna make sure our quads, and again, the cutoff is 90%. Obviously, I would probably, I try to get them as close as I can to 100, if not greater than 100. Why not send them back to the field with a little bit of a bigger cup, right? Bigger strength, good to quad. So we talked about, they should be able to hop on one leg, they should be able to um, have good uh, good quad strength. They should be able to have good balance and control with the quad version. <laughs> Bless you. Right. All of those should be relatively equal or with at least within 90%. And those are the three big ones. Um, the other one being they should have full range, right? Um, now, all the other tests, like they call a single limb square test, the hexagon jump test, the lower extremity functional test, there's all these other tests that take into more hopping, more cutting, um, you think about there's a, there's a test called the T-test, which you have to run, side shuffle forward, back, come backwards. There's a test called the, oh, what's the other one? Um, the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a shuttle drill. It's like the, the shuttle performance test or something like that, where it's, again, you're sh sh running one way, turning. So there's all these tests that look at things as well. So if you were interested in those, there's tons of them. Um, but the ones that we included, right, the ones that we included were really, more focused in on like what are the key ones that they talk about so whether it's all your balance tests so looking at star excursion single limb stuff all your perturbation training and then your hop testing single limb hop triple hop crossover um and that yet yeah, so doing all your hop tests. and remember with these hop tests they look at it as a distance how far can they jump compared to the other side in order for it to count they have to land on it for two seconds, right? It's not just I jump, I land, and I walk onto my other leg. You have to be able to stick it and hold it for two seconds for it to be a for it to count. So not just jumping, but actually stability when you land. Cool. Um, I know it ended up being a lot longer than normal. Sorry about that, guys. Our goal is to try to keep it to an hour, hour and fifteen minutes. But um, obviously, there's a lot with ACL. Like if you were interested in ACL tears, you could read a paper every single day and not never be never run out of something to read um yeah so with that being said anybody have any kind of questions that we didn't answer cameron or chris on there regarded to uh this testing a lot of people are just asking about the webinars and if they can be viewed later yes they yeah. can be viewed later um via the website they will also be on youtube as well um mm -hmm. and we will also be sending an email out um after the webinar so that you guys know they are able to be viewed. Yeah. And then in the email, we'll send out, um, so a lot of the stuff comes from the clinical practice guidelines from ortho section, which takes all the research and they, they have like, you know, what, eight or nine people that just spend years just gathering research, gathering all the research and they comb through it and they decide these are the best stuff to put in there. And that's kind of what our app is built on. Um, but I'll send that out as well. So you guys have the ability to, if you want to read it, look through it. Um, as well Good. joanna had a great question uh yep. just regarding glute strength um maybe maybe just we didn't have time to kind of cover cover that mm -hmm. um but um why is it not greater emphasized in acl rehab as a proximal stabilizer in dynamic movement so glute strength itself is not isolated but they what they call it is they call it frontal plane stability so it, it is one of the big four that they that are that um let's see Bring your window. Oh, hold on. It says something on my computer. One sec. Sorry, guys. What do you guys see? Do you guys see that right there? We see sent questions topics to physio. Okay. okay. Um, so it, it's not that uh, glute strength, it's the frontal plane stability is a primary predictor of re tears. So if you know that's a predictor of re tears, is not having good frontal plane stability, meaning femoral rotation, stuff like that. Um, but they don't necessarily call it glute strength because someone may test really weak, but they actually have really good movement control and their knee doesn't dive in and their quad's strong and they're fine. Like they don't have a big Q angle. Um, maybe they have, you know, skinny legs and they don't need a big proximal stabilizer. Who knows? Um, but the, they, they would just call it frontal plane stability would be the other one. Um, good question. So if they do dive in, Glute strength is obviously one of the big answers to helping improve that frontal plane stability. And with anything, with these ligament tears, remember you are losing one of your big, um, 
not necessarily just stabilizers because they kind of sew that together sometimes, but the, the ability for your body to sense where it is in space, right? So you think about kines, uh, kinesthetic awareness, proprioception, all of those things. Um, it's not, most of the cutoffs are all like, oh, strength and range, but all the studies um, are showing that really to prevent a secondary tear, people have to have really good proprioception, really good body awareness. Um, so there's all these drills on BOSU balls, AirX pads that, um, that should be a huge part of your rehab as you go on down from months like five, six, seven, eight. Early on, it's about getting range, getting strength, minimize swelling, get back to some jogging. But really, you should be able to have them do multitask, eyes open, eyes closed, play their sport, all their things on these unstable surfaces where they're having to train all the other ligaments and their muscle tendons. Right? Think about all those Golgi origin, those um, Golgi tendon origins, all those things um, to be able to sense signals to your brain to correct it. Because normally the ligament will send signals when it gets stretched. So if my knee is stretching valgus, it's stretching my MCL, it sends a signal to my brain, my brain says, pull me back in. If you don't, if you don't have that anymore, because you now have a false or a fake ligament, you need, to, you need other things to send signals quicker. So we didn't really touch base on that too much, but that's a huge part of preventing re-tears is getting back that proprioception and kinesthetic awareness. Cool. For, kind of everybody, for everybody that's still on the uh, webinar, I just wanna let you guys know, we're uh, the next webinar is on the 22nd and we'll be covering Achilles. Uh, oh, sorry. I definitely uh, botched that, didn't I, Chris? What was that? I had on there uh, um, 15th. I think I had on there today's date still. No, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna fix it real quick. All right, if I share screen, let's see. How's that? Boom. 22nd? Yep, two Achilles. Um, let's see. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. I know um, I've received a lot of emails from you guys about certificates of attendance and we are working on it because there's so many of you asking for it. We're trying to figure out a way where you just fill something out and you automatically populate an email to you. So that way I'm not responding to everyone's email every week. And that's why it's taking a while. So I apologize. If it's something you need ASAP, like you're, like you're graduating in a week, right? It is May and you need it. Um, shoot me an email and write that in there and I will try to get you one but we're trying to create a platform that is more efficient to just you guys having to get them to fill out your information and then you just get a certificate or whatever. Um, cool. All right. Take care, guys. Um, thanks for joining. Thank you, Cameron and Chris, for all your guys' help. And I will talk to you guys um, next week. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lemoyne. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thanks everybody. I was able to make it. Thanks, Dr. Lemoyne. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, Fuji. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Dr. Lamorne, thank you. Yep, yep, of course. You want to say hi? Hello. One of my daughters. Oh, nice. Maddie. They do very well. I'm surprised they haven't entered more often. <laughs>